Hello there, ATS EVS 113 students. Dr. John Schroggy here, and I am now going to give you the second of the two lectures that are about heat in the Earth's atmosphere. Um, this will get us to the end of the stuff for Module 1, which is good news. It'll be time to take a quiz and so on. And, um, you know, we're going to be talking in this class, uh, this lecture here, about what's determining the amount of shortwave down that actually, you know, radiation from the sun, solar radiation, that makes it to the surface of the Earth. And we're going to talk about what determines the amount of long wave down, what determines the amount of long wave radiation that comes from the sky and reaches the surface of the Earth. Both of those down properties, long wave down and short wave down, refer to at the surface of the Earth. We're also going to then use that information to talk about things like climate change and the Kyoto Protocol and the much newer Paris Agreement. So basically, just to review a slide that we saw last time, we were building this slide on the left-hand side that was about the ener the radiation budget of the, of the Earth, and there was long wave and short wave radiation and so on, uh, all of which, if you're a survivor of ATS EVS 105, the climate change course, you learned about in considerably more detail at that time. And we're going to be trying to figure out what determines the amount of shortwave radiation that reaches the surface of the Earth and what determines the amount of longwave radiation that reaches the surface of the Earth. So let's dwell first on what determines the amount of shortwave radiation that reaches the Earth. And fundamentally, it's going to depend on two properties. Um, something we're going to call the noon-sun angle, which is going to be a measure of how high in the sky the sun gets on any given day and at any given location. And the length of daylight, how long the sun is actually up. My, my six-year-old son always wants to know why is it hot today in the, when he's talking in the summer, or why is it cold today in the winter, and most of the time the answer I can give him that makes him happy is I tell him that it's about how long the sun is up. The longer the sun is up, the more the ground heats up. We're going to need to figure out this business of sun angles kind of confuses my six-year-old, but you'll get it under control just fine. But both of those ideas, length of daylight and noon sun angle, are fundamentally about both the latitude of the location you're talking about and what day of the year it is. And to understand that, let's just dwell for a second here on some of these basic ideas. What do I mean by noon sun angle? So on this diagram here that I got from a different printing of your textbook, you can see how um, you know they're trying to illustrate the path through the sky that the sun took on a given day, uh, both in June and in December. And you can see how the sun gets much higher in the sky in June than in December. But uh, regardless of what day of the year it is, of course, the sun starts on the horizon. It gets higher in the sky until about no local noon, and then it gets lower in the sky until sunset. To quantify how high in the sky the sun is, we use this idea of noon sun angle, meaning the highest the sun will get in the sky on that day. It doesn't necessarily happen exactly at noon 12.00 on your clock, but we call that the noon sun angle. And the noon sun angle is going to turn out to be important because it's going to be determining a property called the beam spreading. How much ground a certain quantity of sunlight needs to warm up. And again, this comes from an earlier printing of your textbook, although I believe your printing has a similar figure. But I want to show you um, at these three different locations how the noon sun angle is affecting the beam spreading. And it's going to work best if I kind of zoom in on these diagrams one at a time. So this first diagram here is supposed to look like a, a tropical location, see the palm trees and so on. And at this location, we're trying to show that the sun is directly overhead at noon, which is not in general the case. Most of the time, at most locations on Earth, the sun is not directly overhead at any time of the day, including at noon. It'll be as high as it's going to get at noon, but in general, the sun is not directly overhead at noon. But in this location, it is, and the sun is coming from directly overhead. We are measuring noon sun angle in terms of how high above the horizon the sun is. And in this case, the sun is 90 degrees above the horizon. It's directly overhead. Now, what we're trying to illustrate here on this diagram here is how, like, look at the distance between those little beam, those little, um, those little uh, yellow lines on the diagram there. We're calling that a beam, okay? This is not a technical term or anything like that. They're just trying to say, you know, here's a beam of sunlight, and it is this distance, one unit from one, like, ray to the next, okay? We're just trying to say, we're trying to have a little thought here. And notice that a beam of sunlight, one unit wide, is hitting the ground and warming up an area on the ground one unit wide when the, sun, it, the sun's rays are focused onto just a little area on the ground. And then the next beam warms up one unit, you know, maybe that's one meter wide area on the ground. And the next beam of sunlight warms up one, uh, an area one, wide, one unit wide. To understand why that's important, let's move over to the next one location with a barn. 
This is supposed to be someplace in the mid-latitudes, maybe at the latitudes of like Omaha or something like that. And on this particular day, the noon sun angle is 45 degrees. In other words, the sun's high, the highest the sun is going to get on that day is 45 degrees above the horizon. And if you still look at those rays of the sun, see how they're still one unit wide, those beams from the sun or whatever, but when they hit the ground, because they're hitting at an angle, it actually spreads out into an area 1.5, I'm sorry, 1.4 units wide. Okay, now I'd take some trigonometry from high school and so on to actually do the math and figure out why it's that particular size, but see how the same amount of rays of energy from the sun, a beam one unit wide, has to spread out over a larger area of the ground. Um, the same amount of heat and shortwave radiation from the sun is spreading out over a larger area. It just can't heat that area up as much. So we would expect that this, where this barn is, would be getting less shortwave radiation down, short wave down, than the tropical location in the first figure is. And to illustrate that even farther, let's go to this third location here, which has got this igloo. And at, the, at this location of the igloo, let's say that its noon sun angle was only 30 degrees above the horizon. The highest the sun got on that particular day is only 30 degrees above the horizon. Again. The sun isn't like sending colder radiation towards the pole or something like that. One unit wide beam of sunlight carries just as much heat at the pole as it does at the equator. But now that one unit wide beam of heat, look when it hits the ground. Again, it takes trigonometry to prove it, but it has to spread out over area two units wide. The shadows are longer. The same amount of heat has to warm up a bigger area. The same amount of radiation for the sun now spreads out over a larger area. Short wave down is a much smaller quantity at any given spot because the same amount of radiation for the sun is spread out over a large area. This is called beam spreading. Your textbook actually gives you a mathematical equation for beam spreading. Um, I think in some versions of the homework set that I use some semesters, uh, you actually do a small problem involving beam spreading. I think if you're in the ATS-114 lab, I think you do a few small problems with the help of your TA involving the math. There certainly won't be the math of doing beam spreading, though, on your quiz. Um, but no matter what this basic idea here, if we can figure out then the noon sun angle, how high above the horizon the sun will get during the course of the day, we'll be able to get some sense of at least like where is there more shortwave down reaching the surface of the earth and where is there less. All right, so we, we're going to need to start to figure out this business of the noon sun angle and how that is related to other factors about like, you know, how long the sun will be up on any given day and so on. Now, for all intents and purposes, when we're talking about the sun, which is 94 million miles away, for all intents and purposes, the rays of sunlight that reach the surface of the Earth are parallel. I get some crap about that from people on YouTube who look at older versions of this lecture, and they say, um, no, that's not right. The rays are not quite perfectly parallel. They're close enough to parallel. For meteorological purposes, they are actually close enough to parallel. So like on this diagram here, where I have those yellow lines coming in from the left, you're supposed to pretend that the sun is 94 million miles off to the left there. Maybe those lines aren't exactly parallel, but they're close enough for government work. But if you look at those one, two, three, four little um, kind of clip art dudes that I put there on the Earth, because they are sitting on a round planet there, they are all experiencing those sun, those rays of the sun at slightly different angles. The yellowish person that is uh, kind of at a fairly tropical location has the rays of the sun basically hitting him right on the top of the head. Whereas like the orange person who's kind of at a mid-latitude, see how the rays of the sun are kind of coming in from his point of view at about a 45 degree angle. And for that guy who's purple and kind of up at a very high latitude, like maybe Alaska or something, from his point of view, the sun is basically on the horizon. The sun seems to just come in in the direction he's looking. So different latitudes are experiencing different noon sun angles on the same day. And therefore, they're also experiencing different amounts of beam spreading. And actually, if you think about this figure here, it makes good sense that the guy at the high, the purple guy at the high latitudes, he's experiencing a very low sun angle and very large amounts of beam spreading. He's going to have relatively little shortwave radiation from the sun, and that's why he's cold. And that yellow person who's kind of at a fairly tropical latitude, he's experiencing a very high sun at noon sun angle. He's experiencing um, a very large amount of shortwave down at the surface of the Earth, and therefore he's going to have a high, high temperature. It makes good sense. Now, to actually get to 
the details of this, we need to understand a few things about the Earth's orbit around the Sun in a topic that is technically known as Earth-Sun geometry, which sounds a little, I mean, everyone hates that word geog geometry, but we're going to kind of keep it to just the bare minimum here, but just that we're using the right word, this idea about how the orbit of the Earth is set up and so on is called Earth-Sun geometry. As you probably know, the orbit of the Earth Earth orbits, of course, around the sun, and the orbit of the Earth is not exactly a circle. It's actually more of an ellipse, kind of an oval shape. I have it way distorted. It's nowhere near that oval as I have there on the, on the picture, but um, the sun is actually not in the middle of that oval. It's at a point a little bit off to the side of the middle called the focus of the uh, ellipse. And so as the Earth goes around the sun, in this elliptical orbit with the sun not quite at the middle, there is a day in which we are there are days in which we are closer to the sun and there are days in which we are farther from the sun. In fact, there is a day in which we are closest to the sun. That day has a name. It's called perihelion. Para meaning like around, helion, the sun. We're kind of in the vicinity of the sun. Something like that would be how to take apart that word. And on that day, we are 91 million miles from the sun. 91.4 million miles from the sun. As it happens, that day is, an, is January 4th. Now, it can vary a little bit, January 3rd, January 5th. It depends on whether it's leap year and things like that, or whether last year was leap year and so on. Roughly, January 4th is perihelion. And the Earth is farthest from the sun on a day called aphelion. Ap is a uh, Greek prefix that means something like without or away from or something like that. So aphelion, away from the sun. And on that day, the sun, the Earth is about 94.5 million miles away from the sun. And that happens typically right around July 4th. Uh, maybe July 3rd, maybe July 5th, depending on leap year and things like that. Um, but July 4th is close enough. Hey, wait a minute. So the Earth is farthest from the sun in summer and it's closest to the sun in winter? Well, Northern Hemisphere summer and Northern Hemisphere winter, but, you know, keep in mind that's actually the other way around in the, in the Southern Hemisphere. But this difference is not actually all that huge for something that's so far away. Um, if you actually do the math, the Earth overall gets about 6% more sunlight in January than it does in um, July, which sounds kind of like a lot, just because in January the Earth is closer to the sun. Um, but that actually is not enough of a difference in the amount of shortwave radiation to be received on the planet to actually like noticeably change the temperature. Like the planet probably is a little warmer in January than it is in July if you average it over the whole globe, but it's a very small amount. Um, so the difference in the distance the Earth is from the Sun is not what causes the seasons. Uh, rather, it's going to be about the tilt of the Earth's axis. Now, you've all seen globes, and you know the globes are kind of on that goofy, they're tilted like that, and that's actually because that is the way the Earth is tilted. The Earth's axis is tilted about 23 and a half degrees from uh, from, you know, like the plane of the Earth's orbit. And so the Earth is tilted off to one side, as you can see there. And if you look at this diagram here, you can see the Earth's axis is always pointed off in the same direction. It happens to be pointed off towards the North Star, Polaris. Um, not because the North Star, Polaris, exerts some magical force on the orbit of the Earth or something like that. It's a coincidence. At this time in Earth's history, there just happens to be a bright star in the general direction that the axis of the Earth is pointing. But... Um, the axis of the Earth just keeps pointing that direction because nothing is pushing the Earth to point any other direction, okay? Over the course of, like, geologic time, the Earth wobbles and so on. We actually even, in the ATS EVS 105 climate change course, talked a little bit about, like, changes in the Earth's orbit. But for the point of view of, like, weather and meteorology, the Earth's axis is just always pointed the same direction. We're not worried about how the Earth's orbit was configured when the dinosaurs were around and so on. At least not in the context of meteorology. So we have this tilt to the Earth's axis, and we're going to take a few minutes now to go through and look at the, how the Earth's orbit, because of the tilt of the Earth's axis, how the, uh, the noon-sun angles and so on are affected by the uh, tilt of the Earth's axis over the course of the year. We're going to start with June. This is how the Earth is configured at the time of the June solstice. The June solstice is a particular day. It's either June 21st or June 22nd, again, depending on leap year and things like that. And we'll come back as to what exactly that all means is to be the June solstice in just a little bit. But the June solstice, on the June solstice, the Earth is configured like this, where the North Pole is sort of tipped towards the sun, and the South Pole is sort of tipped away from the sun. And... What I want you to note, picture here, I tried really hard to come up with a way to animate that globe on this picture and nothing really worked. 
uh, that what didn't make things worse, not better. So I want you to just a picture the Earth turning there. Now remember, you want to turn on that axis, okay? So the, the rotation here is you know around that axis here, and what I want you to picture here is well, look at the North Pole there. If the Earth is turning on that axis, the North Pole is never going to be in darkness on that day. That day, the Sun is up 24 hours a day at the North Pole. And notice actually at the South Pole, as the Earth turns on its axis there, the South Pole on there is going to always be on the dark side of the Earth. And will, the Sun will never come up on that day at, uh, at, at the South Pole. Now, I told you, length of daylight is actually hugely important to like what temperatures are going to be, well, at least important to the amount of shortwave down being received at the surface of the Earth. So, well, okay, in this case, the North Pole is pretty easy to figure out. It's got a lot of shortwave radiation down on that day. Um, I know it's still the North Pole, but keep in mind there's going to be other complicating issues here about the albedo and the sun angles and so on. But the sun is up all the time at the North Pole on the north on June 21st. The sun never comes up on the south pole on June 21st, the June solstice. Okay. What about other latitudes along the way? Well, I'm going to show you a little trick. This is going to be useful to you if you're in the ATS-114 lab as well. If you picture the Earth rotating on its axis on that day, see I've got a big um, blue arrow there, highlight a given latitude line, like let's say the equator. And at the equator, for a location at the equator, we're now going to figure out how long is the sun up on any given day. Now, on this particular day here, if I think about, you know, picture like if I had managed to make that globe animated there. As the globe went around, you'd be, you know, at any given location would be going around on that latitude line, right? It would be going around the Earth's axis over a 24-hour period. What I want you to notice on this diagram here is that about half of this latitude line that I drew here is on the dark side of the Earth. And at the same time, look at the a half of that line that I drew is on the light side of the Earth, the daylight side of the Earth. So uh, we can say on this particular day, June 21st, at the equator, since half of that line is in the darkness and half of that line is in the light, we're going to estimate that there's about 12 hours of darkness and 12 hours of daylight on that particular location. It's just an estimate, but it'll be adequate to the purposes of both this class and the ATS-114 lab. In contrast, let me highlight another latitude. This is about 40 degrees north, roughly the latitude of Omaha. And if I highlighted this latitude here and looked at it here, see how only about on this day, only about one third of that line is on the dark side of the Earth, and about two thirds of that line is on the daylit side of the Earth? So, again, it's just an estimate here. That's all we're doing here is just coming up with an estimate. Obviously, there are ways to do a huge amount of math and actually figure this out, but we're not going to do that in this class. But for this location, along that latitude line, any place that's at about 40 degrees north on June 21st, we're going to say that about one-third of the day, or about eight hours, will be in darkness, and about two-thirds of the day, or about 16 hours, will be in daylight. So we're going to be getting more hours of daylight than the equator was. Okay? And in fact, if I pick some place even farther north, north of the Arctic Circle as it happens, you know, maybe this is 80 degrees north or something like that, notice how no part of that line is on the dark side of the Earth, and notice how all of the line is on the daylight side of the Earth. And as a consequence, at that location, we can say, at let's say 80 degrees north on June 21st, there will be 24 hours of sunlight. The sun will never set on that day at whatever, let's say that's 80 degrees north or something like that. Oh, that's all, that's all we're going to do. Like, if you're in the, in the 114 lab, it's, you're going to just be setting up a diagram like this where you're going to kind of color in, you're going to illustrate which side of the globe is in the darkness and which side of the globe is in the daylight on your, on your particular day, and then you'll draw these latitude lines, and you'll be able to infer from that things like, um, you know, approximately how many hours of daylight and approximately how many hours of darkness there is. Now, before we move forward with this just too much further, let's take a quick, a uh, couple quick questions just to illustrate this. Um, the Earth. The Earth is closest to the sun in January, April, July, or October. When is that date that the Earth is closest to the sun? Make a choice from those four options and get a little feedback before you move on to question two.